Hey folks, today I've got a complete user guide, beginner's guide, full on course, whatever the heck you want to call it on the Garmin 400 965. Now this video is definitely not sponsored by Garmin. I'm going to tell you what things work well and what things don't work so well and a whole bunch of tips and tricks along the way. And then finally, before we start, note that my full review is up in the corner as well as a complete comparison between the 965 and the Garmin Epix, including 65 plus differences. So with that, this is the 400 965. This is the white edition right here. I've got the black edition here in the box. Uh, it is essentially the same except it's it's black. I'll put a picture on the screen right now. Uh, and as you can see, this watch is very, very similar looking to the existing 400 955. In fact, they share a lot of the same features and code base under the covers. Uh, but the biggest difference is that the 965 is an AMOLED display and the 955 has a MIPS display. Uh, essentially, this is an always on display here versus this one. You can see it turns off when I put it down for a long period of time but you can also have what's called always on settings. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, so when you see the screen dim, so you'll see it dim first and then turn on. That's why I'm kind of tapping it and touching it. Uh, so it goes ahead and it stays on. When it's on your wrist though, it'll stay on the entire time in a dim mode and always on. And then once you raise your wrist, it goes to full brightness. But again, more on that in just a second. Uh, the size of these watches are identical at 47 millimeters across. The display is bigger on the 965 at 1.4 inches. Uh, anyways, this is not a review, so I'm gonna talk but more of the how things work side of things. Uh, so looking at the band straps here, they are not technically quick release bands, but you can remove them if you want to. Uh, so if you just kind of slide this like that, you can then put a tiny little like screwdriver in there and pop these off. And then you can install your own uh, quick fit bands from Garmin that you buy extra or third party bands. So uh, you can do that if you want, but they're not like a easy access removal sort of thing. On the back is that charging port. Uh, there is the standard Garmin charging cable. It does come with a USB-C version of it now, which is kind of nice, but it is a standard Garmin charging cable. You've also got the optical sensor right there uh, that does things like obviously heart rate, but also pulse ox or blood oxygenation levels. Uh, it does it both for sport mode and 24 by seven. It actually changes the power level in between those to get the best accuracy. Uh, so on the side here, you have your buttons. Let me just get back to the main menu there. You have three buttons here, two buttons there, the standard Garmin button layout, but it is also a touchscreen. So you can see I can tap it there, it turns on the brightness, uh, and then I can swipe down into the widget glances. So this is the AMOLED screen. AMOLED is simply the technology, and it's this bright kind of vibrant screen, the same as you might see on an Apple Watch or Samsung Watch uh, in that same category. Now there are pros and cons to it. The main con is that it burns more battery. The main pro is that it's way more visible, especially in darker conditions, uh, dark room, etc. Uh, it's really easy to see. And you can see that even just right here in this well-lit studio, I mean, just look at the, the difference right there. It's pretty obvious between a MIPS-based display and a 965. Now, some have said that it's harder to see outdoors in the sun, but I, I haven't seen that be the case. I actually spent the last two weeks in sunny Florida. In fact, seasonally uh, uh, warm, unseasonally warm right now, and unseasonably sunny. Uh, and I had no problems on any of my workouts any day on the brightest sun conditions. Uh, and here's actually a picture I took just yesterday in the sun here. Uh, not the same Florida sun, but still sunny nonetheless. Of the 955 and the 965 side by side, uh, and as you can see, they're both equally visible in direct sun. You can see the shimmer on the bezel right there uh, once you raise your wrist up. Now, if you have it in a dim mode down like this, then yeah, it's a little bit more hard to see than MIPS in those scenarios, but I don't generally in the bright sun need to see my watch at an angle like this. And even then I can just tilt it and it, it works just fine. So I think some of that myth around AMOLED displays being hard to see in the sun comes from older AMOLED displays, in which case that was absolutely 100% true. But displays in the last like two years, one and a half, two years from a lot of companies, Garmin and Samsung and Apple, it just fundamentally isn't an issue. And, and so just, just keep that in mind. Um, anyways, this is a display right here. Uh, and you've got two basic settings on it. The default is called gesture mode. Uh, so if I go into the settings, I press this middle left hand button and I go on down here all the way down to system. Then you have a display and you have three options. During activity, general use and during sleep. Pretty self-explanatory, I think. Uh, general use is your day, day bit there, and you have the always on option. This is what I turned on manually. This is not the default option. The default looks like this. And this means my wrist is like this, not facing me, the screen will go off. It'll go black like you saw earlier on. Uh, versus when I tap this here, it means it's on my wrist like this, it goes to a dim state, and I raise my wrist up, 
and it goes to an always on state. And you can see a little snippet of what that looks like right here, that kind of transition back and forth between dim and always on. Uh, and it works pretty well. In past Garmin watches, like two years ago, the gesture based stuff was, was not awesome. Uh, it's pretty good now. It's not, it's still not yet Apple level good. Uh, and like the nuance there is something like this Apple will pick up on my wrist, like that little tiny bit, uh, versus Garmin won't often pick that up. Garmin takes a little more churn uh, to get that there, but it's it's definitely, I think, good enough for most scenarios. Anyways, I choose uh, the option for always on because that's, I just want it always on. That does kill your battery life by roughly about half. Garmin says an always on configuration, you should get about six days of smartwatch mode uh, versus like 16 or something. I'll put the battery specs on the screen right now. Uh, and I find that pretty accurate in terms of killing your battery life by roughly half. Uh, the other thing you can do is to change the brightness level, which will increase the battery even more. I use a default brightness of two thirds uh, for you know general usage, uh, but you can go down to one third, and you can see the difference there. Um, you know, it's it's definitely brighter for certain. Of course, you can go to full brightness, which is just like taking that battery with gasoline and and burning it. But in any case, there's three brightness levels for the uh, daily mode, but there's actually more brightness levels in the sleep mode right here. So if you go down to brightness, uh, you see there's four brightness levels for sleep. Uh, and that's notable because this is the sleep mode brightness level when it comes out of being touched or once you like wake it up. But check this out. So if I go all the way back here, back to the watch face, and then I hold the upper left hand button. And there you see there's an option for sleep mode right there. This will automatically actually activate at night, but I can tap into it uh, and you can see it turns it, the dimness down. But then it goes into this really low power state there. Uh, and this is sleep mode, so it's super dim. It's going to turn off because it's on the table, of course. But this is sleep mode. Uh, and then once you tap down here, uh, you can see it's still pretty dimmed in that sleep mode. Uh, I'm going to turn this back off, though. And again, this can be automated, so it turns on every night at 11 p.m. And, you know, turns on at 6 a.m. Or whatever times you want, or whatever days you want. You can different schedules for different days of the week. Uh, but that is sleep mode and the display. Okay, and if you are finding this video interesting or useful, now is a great time to whack that like button. It really does help out the channel and the video quite a bit. So let's talk about some of the features of the glances and kind of the basic activity bits here first. And again, remember the YouTube chapter is along the bottom right there. So this is the watch face right here. Uh, you can go ahead and fully customize it by just simply holding this left hand button, choosing watch face. Uh, and there are a bunch of stock watch faces. You can see I'm just kind of iterating through them right now, uh, right there. And then each one of the components on the watch face can be customized. There are also third party watch faces as well. So you can download watch faces from Garmin's Connect IQ app, put some screenshots on the screen right there. Uh, and you can even make your own watch face with like your kid's picture or your own picture, or your dog's picture, or just a picture of ice cream, whatever you, whatever you really want. Uh, so going back here in this menu, watch face, uh, I can then choose this one. I can choose to customize it and I can say, you know what? I don't want my, uh, let's see, HRV status there. I want it to be something else. And you can see if you have two max steps, et cetera, going through all these different options there. Uh, one bummer here is that on the, let me find where I was there, HRV, there we go. On the 955, you have the ability to show training status, training load right there. Uh, you can see uh, I'm low there and it's at 733. That isn't an option on the 965. I don't get why I've brought that up to Garmin. Hopefully they fix that, remedy that. Uh, this is one of my favorite features of the, the 955 and it was also the same on the 745 and it's not here. So hopefully they fix that. Scrolling on down here, you have the widget glances. Uh, so each one of these glances represents a data area. In this case, HRV status or training readiness. Uh, and I can crack into each one of these to get more details. But I can also scroll down and change them. I can change the ordering them. I can remove them. I can add them. Uh, so for example, you see steps right here. I crack into that. And this is steps since midnight. Obviously, I was sleeping then. Uh, then you know, drop off the kids at school and you know, et cetera throughout the day here. Uh, still, you know, morning-ish. So uh, the steps are a bit lower and haven't done any workouts yet today. And I can tap down on this and I can see steps for the last seven days. I can see distance for the last seven days. Uh, and again, this is just for the steps one. And each one of these categories can be customized or tweaked. So I can go all the way down here, uh, going, going all the way down, boop, 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 edit. Uh, and then easier go through up and then add. And then you can see I can even create folders for this if I want to. Uh, so there's a notification coming in right now uh, from, I think that's Zwift. Uh, and I can go down here and I can choose different glances that I want to add. Uh, all these are ones I have not yet added to my list. 
uh, and I can again reorder these if I want to. Uh, widget Advanced is one of my favorite things, just makes it really easy to see information. Uh, I'm gonna go back though here, and I'm gonna go down into the sleep bits just to kind of start off there. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't sleep very much last night. I'm kind of jet lagged. I flew like two nights ago uh, from the US to here and still kind of wonky. Uh, so about five hours of sleep right there. And you can see the sleep details. So sleep score, sleep quality, the sleep stages, and uh, these are all kind of displayed different ways. You slept too little and your battery or your body did not recharge. You may feel very tired today. This is pretty much spot on accurate. This is correct. Uh, now, what is in terms of accuracy here? Uh, I find that the times I went to sleep are basically spot on. Here's your sleep score. It gives you a score over the course of the um, each night, and you can see it's declined. Uh, you know, my basically my red eye flight was around there. I actually slept after I landed, and it did correctly track that to my surprise. Uh, so I only slept like an hour on the plane uh, coming over the ocean, and then once I landed, I went to sleep for like four or five hours. Not technically ideal, but it worked, um, and it actually did track that, which I'm surprised about. Uh, so back up here though. The these sleep times uh, are relatively correct, I think. Actually, I went to bed rather late last night, or fell asleep rather late last night. Uh, and then the wake up time is spot on correct as well. Uh, the sleep stages though, I don't put much stock in that from any vendor. Uh, partially because you can't even judge this stuff. Like the actual uh, systems used to go ahead and validate these are only about 80% accurate. 90% in the best case, super professional scenario, which is still like, a very low bar for accuracy when you talk about uh, human data. Like if I looked at heart rate accuracy, for example, I would never accept 80% accuracy or even 90% accuracy for stuff. That's just super incredibly low, uh, especially when it's binary as to which stage you're in being like very different from each other. So tapping on back here, uh, a couple of the things to note. If we go down, you can see, for example, the same thing for heart rate. Uh, I can tap into that. Here's my resting heart rate, uh, 48 today so far. And you can see the last four hours of heart rate data. And if this is on my wrist, I would see my heart rate up top there. Uh, I can see my seven day resting heart rate, uh, tapping on back here. This is body battery. Uh, the idea behind body battery is that it's like a one day snapshot as how much energy you have. Uh, since midnight here, uh, basically it peaked at 62 and I woke up this morning and it's, it's all downhill. Uh, again, I didn't have much sleep last night so it didn't charge up as much. Uh, now, you can charge up more, like if I were to relax on the couch for a while, it would probably, you know, either flatline or increase maybe a little bit. And if I went out for a strenuous workout, it would decrease at the end of that. Uh, body battery is a great thing to focus on on a per day basis. I'm not focus on. It's a great thing to evaluate how you feel on that given day. It's not so great, though, for trending over time. And for that, it'll be something like trending readiness, which we'll talk about in just a second. All of these stats are available on Garmin Connect, the website, as well as Garmin Connect Mobile. That's your smartphone app. You can see a couple examples of these right here and you can trend them over different time periods so whether it be seven days or you know a month or a year or six months depending on which metric it is uh, and you can really dive into this data and some have said that there are just way too many places you can dive into the data in the Garmin Connect app and that's probably true there's just an enormous amount of places you can dive into data there. Now, since we're talking about sleep, it makes sense to talk about the morning report, which is what happens once you wake up. I hope you wake up anyways. Uh, anyways, the morning report basically shows up on your wrist automatically and shows up as an overlay on your watch uh, every time you wake up in the morning. And what it starts off with is saying usually good morning, uh, and it shows behind it the weather, uh, and it shows, it's actually the weather is even aligned to where you are. A cool example I gave was uh, back a week and a half or two weeks ago, uh, I was in Florida in a super foggy morning, uh, it actually showed the fog as the background on the screen. It even showed the trees and the fog. And it just so happened that where I was staying, I looked out was trees and fog. It was a really cool, somewhat accidental thing, but also somewhat purposeful. They're overlaying that weather there. Uh, from there, I can drop down and I can see a couple of tidbits about the day. I can see how much I slept. I can see my training readiness score. I can see any scheduled workouts are coming up there. I can see the weather, but I can actually customize these if I want to. So if I go into the settings options, left-hand side there, and then go down all the way to appearance, uh, and then from there into morning report. Uh, you can see one, I can just turn it off if I don't like it, though everyone, this seems to be like everyone's favorite feature, so you're probably gonna like it. Uh, and then you have the edit report and your name. Uh, so you can, for example, choose whether or not it wants to say good morning, Ray, or good morning, whatever you want it to say. I don't, I don't choose that, but you could. Uh, edit report, and you can see the different components that show up. So right now I have training readiness, I have my structured workouts that are scheduled, I have my sleep, my HRV status, weather, and my calendar. But I can also add in body battery, intensity, or steps. Uh, not a ton of options here, but maybe you don't want to see your calendar. Maybe you just don't want to see that work day ahead. You can remove that. Or if you live in a, a crappy weather place like here in Amsterdam, and you just know it's going to be 
miserable and cold and rainy and windy out every day, you'd, you might want to remove that too. Um, but you can customize this how you see fit. Anyway, so with that sleep data covered and some of the basics, let's start to kind of chisel down a little bit deeper and talk about HRV tracking, a heart rate variability. So if I go down here, uh, you'll see the very first one that I've selected, uh, or I've uh, reordered, sorry, is HRV status. And you show right now, or I show right now, that I'm basically in the green zone there. 55 milliseconds in balanced. Uh, 55 milliseconds was uh, my HRV status for the last seven days, or is my HRV status average for the last seven days. My last night average of 51 milliseconds. Uh, now this green zone there is my green zone. Uh, it's not your green zone, it's not my wife's green zone. It's customized to me in my normal average, my baseline of 46 to 61 milliseconds. Uh, and so the way HRV status works on Grumman devices is it takes 19 nights worth of sleep uh, to build up that initial database. And then it trends that over the next 90 days after that. So you've got this kind of continual curve of the last 90 days of the data that it's working off of. The reason you want these longer time periods is HRV isn't great for tracking just one night at a time. I mean, you'll certainly see the impacts of things after one night. If I go down right here, this is my HRV status last night. You can see it started off absurdly low at uh, 2.40 in the morning at 25, uh, and it increased over the night to 87, which is actually pretty good for me. Uh, now, there are factors that do influence this. Uh, certainly, uh, fatigue influences it, but so does alcohol. In fact, you'll see alcohol like burn off over the course of the night. It's actually kind of fascinating. Uh, drugs can also impact it. Uh, not necessarily like bad drugs, but even just, you know, normal medications can impact it. And that's why some people will actually do their HRV status checks manually in the morning, uh, kind of outside the Garmin ecosystem after they wake up. But that has its own caveats and that you have to be super precise about it. And I found that, you know, in doing that kind of repetitively, you get very different values. So Garmin just averages the entire night's worth of data. Uh, different companies do different things, but that's how Garmin does it. Uh, so you can see that there and you can see the averages over the different nights. Uh, now, going back up here into this baseline, uh, if I were to go ahead and have a whole bunch of days where I was sick, for example, I got the flu back in December, uh, my HRV, you know, basically plummeted during that time period. The same is true for other sicknesses. Most times your HRV values decrease quite substantially. Uh, and then inversely, when I was on vacation last summer for a week in Greece, uh, my HRV status values were the highest they've ever been. It was, it was amazing. Uh, and so, you can use this as just sort of a way to go ahead and look at uh, kind of how recovered you are, uh, but I wouldn't say it's like the end-all be-all. Just use it as one factor in what you do, which is sort of what Garmin does. Use it as one factor uh, in the larger scheme of things. Cracking on back here, I keep saying cracking, I'm not sure why, it just happened in today. Uh, I've got training readiness. Uh, this is the next piece and probably one of the most substantial pieces of Garmin's like training kind of philosophy on the 965 and it came out in the 955 last year and it's also on the Phoenix 7 and Epix and also on the 265 on my wrist right there. Uh, now, the 265 video for this same kind of thing will be coming hopefully shortly. Uh, I'll probably film it just after this one here. Uh, so stay tuned if you want that. This also has training readiness and this cost, you know, like almost half the price, uh, like 200 bucks, 150 bucks less uh, than the 965. The purpose of training readiness is an umbrella of whether you should be or are ready to train. It's exactly as the name implies. Are you ready to train? So if I open this up, you see right now I'm in moderate. I'm ready for the day. Uh, it's a score from zero to 100. Actually, it's a score technically from one to 100. When you get to zero, the score goes away. It's kind of funny. Uh, and it basically is like, yeah, you, you really shouldn't do anything today. Uh, but it's also a live score. So when I woke up, this score was lower. And then over the course of the day, it's going to increase. Uh, so right now you see it's at 53. And the reason for that increase is I haven't done a workout yet today. So my training readiness score is based on different components. And one of those components is recovery. Yet if I go out and do a hard workout, it's going to drop. Uh, so if we look at this here, go down, these are the factors for training readiness. Uh, sleep, recovery time, HRV status, acute load, in other words, how much training have you done lately, sleep history, and stress history. Uh, if we open up each one of these, you'll see sleep. This is last night's sleep. Uh, so, you know, it's fair in the grand scheme of what it thinks for me, but it's, this particular night was poor. Uh, if I go back here, recovery time. This is 15 hours based on a workout I did last night in a workout. Uh, if I go back again, you see HRV status. That's what we just saw a minute ago. There we go. Uh, acute load. This is my training load over the last seven days. Uh, you can see, you know, my flight on uh, Monday night, I did a workout before then, and I've kind of, kind of tapered off my workouts a little bit to compensate for that fatigue from the jet lag. Uh, so I'm below my normal range here, which is actually a pretty high range, up to about uh, 16, 1800. Uh, and that's a fair bit of, of load. So I'm considered low right now because I'm below that particular uh, normal range. 
Now, if I go back here, uh, I go to sleep history. You can see the sleep history over the last seven nights declining, which is why I'm now in orange as opposed to green. And then you can see stress history here, uh, which is fine. It's pretty low stress overall. Again, the point though of this whole thing is to look at all of these factors. The two biggest factors here on your training readiness score, so this score right there, 53, uh, is your sleep last night and your recovery time. Uh, those are fundamentally the biggest factors. If I go out and do a really hard long run today, for example, uh, this will plummet my training readiness score probably down to like the low single digits. Uh, and just to kind of show an example of this, I took some photos or video, whatever it was, uh, a couple of days back on one of my workouts. And you can see here is first to score what it looked like before my workouts. And I believe this was a bike followed by a run. So an indoor trainer session followed by a, I think, 20 minute run or something like that. Uh, and then you can see afterwards, here is a score after that workout. So, you know, again, an hour and a half or two hours later after these workouts, uh, it does directly impact that score. Now, one of the components related to training readiness is training status. Uh, now, if you've had Garmin watches for a long time, you are familiar with training status. It's a thing that tells you you are unproductive. Uh, and that's actually why training readiness like was created a year ago is because training readiness and training status were meant to be different things, but sort of became one thing. Uh, training status is designed to tell you, are you training appropriately? Think about it like from a coaching standpoint. Uh, if you're a coach, your coach would look at your workouts and say, no, that's, that's not gonna reach your goals because you're doing stupid things, right? You have you know, uh, too many easy workouts or you have all hard workouts and no recovery workouts or whatever the case is. That's what training status was for. The problem is that training status got kind of conflated and confused with is your body ready to train? So, you know, did you get enough sleep last night or have you, you know, been fatigued or is your HRV status, all those sort of things, it got sort of mixed up together. So Garmin made those splits clear uh, last year as part of the 955 and that carries through here in training status. Training status has essentially three core components, your VO2 max, your HRV uh, status and your acute load. Uh, and it's really acute load that's the most important here. Uh, so acute load is again, as I mentioned earlier on, your total training load over the last seven days. And that's in particular looking at this green section right there. My green tunnel is really wide, meaning that I've got a huge variability between what I can ramp up to on the high side, number of workouts that I have each week uh, in terms of total load. Uh, and then generally speaking, load means intensity. So uh, if I go out and do an hour of just easy pedaling, right like on a you know beach cruiser uh, that's going to be a very very low intensity workout uh, from a heart rate standpoint and it's going to be a trivial amount of load maybe like 20 or, or 30 or something like that units uh, versus if I do uh, an hour of just like hard tempo run that could be like 200 uh, from a training load standpoint so again it's about really about heart rate intensity and you can see right here that green load is essentially over the last uh, 30 days or 28 days in particular, uh, what that looks like. That's my tunnel. Uh, and in fact, if you go on down here to load ratio, this is one of the new features on the 965 and it's showing chronic load and acute load. Chronic load is the average, roughly speaking, of the last four weeks acute load. So imagine you have a month with four, four weeks in it, uh, and each one of those weeks has an acute load factor of say 700 or 900, 1000, whatever it may be. Uh, this is sort of the average of those. Now, the trick here is that your acute load, this piece here, dynamically burns off. The idea being that, let's say I did a uh, two hour hard run uh, today, like a long run, but a little harder one. That has a pretty big impact on my body as of today, and it has a big impact tomorrow but it has a less of an impact a week from now, right? That, that's no longer impacting my day-to-day -day existence. Uh, acute load is designed to do the same thing. In other words, things that happened seven days ago are far less uh, impactful and they burn off, if you will, uh, more than things that happened just a day ago. Now, if I go down from acute load, you see exercise load. This is essentially looking at the division of those different types of uh, workouts up. And then from there, I see my load ratio. Load ratio is new on the 965, as I mentioned a minute ago, along with the chronic load. Uh, this is also actually visible in the Garmin Connect mobile app and even visible for other watch users as well. Uh, it sounds like it's visible for the Phoenix 7 watch users and some Phoenix 6 users uh, and also 955 and 965 uh, and then those watches not the phoenix 6 but this phoenix 7 epics 
955. We'll see this on their watch in the next quarterly update. Uh, but load ratio is basically just dividing these two numbers from each other. So that's all it is. So if I had my acute load, and my chronic load match, it'd be 1.0. Uh, this green zone here goes from 0 0.8 to 1.5, uh, meaning that you have more potential to do, you know, a couple of really hard workouts as part of a training camp and still be safe. Uh, but if you go below 0 0.8, that means you're in the low side of things. So here's a picture from last week or something like that. Uh, as I was coming off of a training block, you can see it's a bit higher up on that scale, uh, both the acute load against the chronic load, and therefore I'm higher in that green range. Well, this little gadget ga gauge thing is new here. The concept isn't actually that new, certainly not to Garmin. It's been around for years from other companies, uh, but also even this was visible more or less if you went down into load focus right there. Uh, you could basically just add up all these numbers and divide by the weeks and kind of get the same rough thing. Uh, so load focus just shows you which types of areas you're focused on over the last four weeks, last 28 days. And if I go down again, you see the VO2 max, uh, HRV status and recovery time and heat acclimation. Uh, heat acclimation, this is notable in my case because I was in Florida, it was super hot out. And so if I can open that up and see, I was becoming more and more acclimated. And now that I'm not in Florida anymore, uh, you can see it's starting to burn off again. And uh, now this is all relative, like heat acclimation, yes, after X number of weeks, I was there for about two weeks and I got up to what was like 60, I think, percent acclimated or something like that. It's all relative. Like. I'm not gonna change my acclimation in two weeks, but I'm gonna be more used to it than I was the very first day I landed. That's absolutely the case here. And this is also true for altitude acclimation. You'll see the same sort of thing as well. Uh, unfortunately here in the Netherlands and in Florida, there isn't much altitude to work with. Uh, now, going up to VO2 max here, I can open this up and this will track my VO2 max over time for both cycling and running. Unfortunately, this hasn't really been working for me on any of the Garmin wearables now for like four months. And I've had a pretty massive ramp up of training uh, starting in you know, January 1st, and these values have not changed. In fact, it's so notable because if I go back here and I go down into this uh, right there, this is the same sort of display and you can see 53 for VO2 max. Uh, and if I open this up, you can see cycling and go down here, you can see my 5K prediction time. So what's notable is that these have actually decreased. Uh, in the last four weeks, it's been constant because I've been on vacation and kind of tapered off things, but you can see they dropped pretty dramatically there. I can look at, oops, sorry. I can tap this to see my 10K prediction times. You can see it went down from 43 to 42. Tap this again, went from like, you know, 138. And even before that, it was like at 140 something down to 134 uh, and so on. And Garmin's been digging into it. Uh, and even though I know like my times and my FTP have increased quite dramatically in the last uh, two plus months, but these numbers aren't shifting. And so hopefully, hopefully they figure that out. Because one of the things that matters from that is if I go back here to training recovery, that is one of the components of the training status. So eventually, you know, right now I'm in recovery because my acute load is low. Uh, but once my acute load is, you know, either increasing or uh, kind of in that main range there, then my steady state there in HRV balance means I'm basically stuck in training status of maintaining, like you see on the, on the screen right now. Next, let's talk about the race calendar and training plans. So race calendar is a feature on Garmin Connect where you can add a race to your calendar. Uh, and I'll show you this race calendar widget. I'll show you in just a second there. You can add all types races you can search for races automatically and when you do so you can even put the location in there the exact time of day uh, and all these components are actually used by the race calendar and race widgets so if i go down here these are widgets you can add you can see there's two events on my calendar i put the line and half marathon on there I'm, I'm not racing that but just as a way to kind of demonstrate this and i've also got a triathlon there as well uh, so in this case I can tap open to the Leiden Half Marathon. You can see what time of day it is. It shows it as 11 a.m. I pulled this from the database. I'm not sure if this is correct. This would seem actually about right for most Dutch races that start a bit later in the day, which is great. Uh, but I can go down here. You can show you what it estimates my current time as. My current prediction time is 1.34. And I go down again, and you can see on average on May 14th, it's 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I had switched the watch of Fahrenheit last week in the US, uh, and it's 57 degrees the high, 45 as the low. But again, that's it. Normally at 11 a.m., it's 54 degrees, which is it's pretty cool. It pulls all this stuff in there. Uh, if I go up here, I can open this up, and you can see the daily suggestions. So it's going to go ahead and do daily suggestions every single day to prepare me for this event. It does this for running events, and it kind of does it for cycling events, but it's way better at running events. It does not do this for 
for triathlons yet at this point, uh, unfortunately. In fact, it won't even show triathlons uh, correctly in other race widgets, so something to keep in mind. And you can see what these daily suggestions are. So today, a 30-minute base workout, tomorrow 30-minute, uh, Saturday, and then a long run on Sunday for 120, and so on. And it's pretty clear about these. I can open up this threshold one right there, and you can see there's a structure workout for that. And these are generally pretty good predictions, or pretty good, uh, not predictions, pretty good uh, recommendations across the board here. Uh, and the workout structure follows what most coaches would do. Garmin, this whole thing has been revamped in the last year as part of the 955 release, uh, and it carries through here in the 965 as well. Uh, and again, it shows you what it, the workout's focused on. Uh, I can go down, you can see what it's benefiting, uh, and you can see each one of the steps here. And the workout, the actual watch will guide you through the workout steps if you want to. Uh, so that's for the running side. I can look at the plan overview here, and you can see this is the base phase right there, March 9th and March 23rd, the build phase, uh, the peak phase, the taper phase, uh, and then the recovery phase after that. And this is all free. It's all in the watch. It doesn't cost anything extra. Uh, and you can choose this for pretty much any running event, uh, and you can add the exact course in there so it's training you for that particular course, uh, again, from like a distance standpoint, uh, elevation, etc. cetera. Uh, so going on back here, you can look settings on this. Uh, I can choose a long workout day if I want to. I could say, hey, I want the long workout to be to be on Tuesdays as opposed to Saturday, whatever you may want. Uh, for example, I do that. My long runs are on the weekdays. Uh, that way I'm not impacting the weekends for like kid stuff and all that. I just have it, I just do it at night or whatever the case may be there. You can choose the target pace type, uh, pace or heart rate. Uh, there is no option at this point to do power-based running workouts from the daily suggested workouts. You can do your own power-based running workouts using running power from that, but uh, today it's just pace and heart rate. Uh, going on back here, oh, you can pause training as well, so if life happens, you can you can do that. Uh, anyways, going on back, we're like way deep into this at this point. Uh, if I go back again, I can go down here to the race widget, so a little bit further on down, and it's pretty similar. You're basically like shortcutting some of that stuff right there. You can see it's nine weeks to the race. I can open this up. Uh, you're going to see essentially the same information we saw up above. And then as we get closer to the exact race date, uh, it'll show me the exact weather for that particular day. So that's also useful. And also you can customize the icon up there at the top as well as put your own race picture there. If you have like a race logo, et cetera, uh, you can load that in there. So going on back here, I think it's time to start some sport modes. Uh, to access the sport mode list, you tap this upper right hand button right there. And this brings you to the sport modes. These are my favorite sports at the top right there. So run, track, run, treadmill, hike, etc. But I can go on down to the bottom here and I see more of my favorites. Uh, and then eventually I have the ability to add sport modes. And so these are all the modes that it supports. Um, I will throw on the screen here. Actually, I'll let you see all the modes right there. Probably a little bit easier right now. Uh, these are all the sports keep on going down here. And the main thing to understand about Garmin sport modes is that most of these, the vast majority of these, also have data that go with them. Uh, so if you were to compare sport modes on something like a Polar Watch, a Sunto Watch, and to a large degree an Apple Watch, they are mostly focused on the categorization side as well as the caloric side. Uh, so do you have the right calorie burn for that particular workout? Uh, but in the case of Garmin, they're also gathering data from that. So if I look at, uh, for example, mountain bike here, uh, it gathers grit and flow data. Basically, what's that trail condition like as it goes down? And it records that into this. Uh, if I go down to some of the water sports ones here, uh, or snowboard and skiing, for example. This is tracking your runs for every single workout. Uh, so it's actually showing you max speed, max descent, uh, all the kind of stuff automatically, and it automatically tracks the runs. So as you go up a chairlift, it stops the watch recording, and then it goes down again as soon as you start descending again. Super, super cool stuff. In cross-country skiing modes, it automatically collects your cross-country skiing power, assuming you have one of the heart rate straps that does that. Uh, kayak, sandalboard, uh, all of those sports have metrics that are being collected that most other companies don't do. Uh, now, there are cases where I wish Garmin would add just some basic sport modes for categorization. For example, ice skating, which is you know thing here in the Netherlands. Uh, there is no sport mode to choose on a Garmin watch for that at all, despite them sponsoring the one of the Dutch skating teams as an official sponsor. They can't actually use their watch for their sport. Anyways, it is what it is, uh, but there is, you know, pros and cons to that versus like both Polar and Sunto have ice skating modes and different skating modes as that as well. Uh, but Garmin has none of those on the watch. Instead, you can only categorize it after the fact. Anyways, I'm just going to click back once to get myself back to the menu here and then press start again. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and open up the run option. Uh, now, within this, you can see today's daily suggested workout, 30 minutes right there. Uh, I can go down and I can see what it's, again, the purpose that we saw earlier on. Uh, I can also just say, you know what, no, I'm not today. Uh, dismiss this, or I could have chose uh, more suggestions if I want to. I'm just going to choose dismiss this for right now. 
And this is the new waiting screen. Uh, so this is a screen where you basically wait for GPS uh, and you also see any sensors that you have. And it shows live track ready. That's because it has my phone with me. So if I have my phone with me, it'll use a cellular on my phone to go ahead and send live track link to people I've predefined, in my case, my wife and a couple of friends, and they can see exactly where I am. And they'll even see my sensor data, like my heart rate and my cycling power, uh, all that stuff in there, my pace, et cetera. Uh, and if I have a course loaded, they will see that as well. Uh, so on the left-hand side, I can press this middle button right there to get into the run settings. Uh, now I can change the run settings, do things like data pages and whatnot. I'll show you that in a second. I can load up different training options. Uh, so structural workouts, uh, for example, this is my interval workout from last night. It's not last night was not Friday, but I named it Friday from a couple weeks ago and just been reusing it. Uh, and so you can see right there, the 13K or so of intervals repeats. Uh, I could load that in if I wanted to, and then I can go back here and go back again. You can see I can create my own intervals on the watch itself. So if I just want to do something really quick, I can do that. Pace Pro plans. These are useful for races where you want to go ahead and uh, hit a certain target time. You can do all this uh, on the watch, but you can also do it on Garmin Connect where it's a little bit easier. Uh, and if you have hills in the course, it'll account for those hills. You can do things like negative split, for example. Uh, so you know you get faster over the course of a race. Strava Live segments, lactate threshold guided test, set a target, race and activity, or training calendar. Tap back again, we got navigation. I'm gonna talk all about navigation in just a second, uh, but this is where we load a course uh, in here. And then we've got live track, uh, but I'm gonna go back up to run settings. So these are my data screens. I can open this again, and you can see each one of these screens along the left-hand side is a little bubble. I can go down and I can customize these screens. Some of these are custom, some of them are stock. Some of them are stock data pages, like the stamina one right here. And you can add or remove the data pages as you see fit. Uh, and this is the running dynamics one. Uh, and this is the map one. And I can go down to the bottom and I can add a new page. I can open this up. I can choose what type of page, custom data, heart rate zone gauge, running power, virtual power, compass, elevation, uh, Garmin inReach. That's the device that uh, satellite communicator device in case you're out of cellular range. I'm gonna go up to the top and choose custom beta, and I can choose the different layout. Uh, you can have up to six different data fields on a different data page, or on a given data page, sorry. And then once I've chosen this, I can go ahead and choose what every single one of these fields are. So timer, distance, pace, speed, heart rate, stamina, running, dynamics, cadence, pace, pro, power, temperature, elevation, compass, navigation. And this is just the categories, by the way. And then within that, I can see the different timer options. I mean, there is a gazillion options here to work with, uh, and each one of these have tons of them. And you can add your own data fields using Garmin Connect IQ, which there is a gazillion more data fields to put on here. Uh, the watch is still limited to two concurrent Garmin Connect IQ data fields per sport at the same time. You can load more uh, Connect IQ fields into the watch, but you can't use more than two at a time, which is just stupid at this point. I'm just gonna be really brutally honest there. That came out like almost a decade ago now. Uh, on the Garmin Edge devices, you can use up to 10 of them, but here you can use only two. And given the number of sensors that Garmin supports now through that, like it just, it makes no sense. And that's mostly for the geeks out there, but still it's, it's super annoying. Uh, anyways, you can also customize all of this using your phone app as well. So you don't have to do it on the watch. You can go into the settings and you can see some of the screenshots right there and you can do all the exact same thing there. In fact, you can customize virtually every setting on the watch now via your phone. Uh, but the only ones you can't do is to uh, load additional maps if you wanted to and to pair two sensors. Uh, so things like cycling sensors or extra heart rate traps, uh, you can't do that from the phone, uh, maybe someday, but that's fine. I mean, you do that from the watch anyways, because you're probably gonna wanna go ahead and actually be able to connect to those sensors, so it's not something you need to have, uh, it, whatever, it just is what it is. Now, once you're ready to do your run, you just press this top right button there, uh, and then it starts that workout. You can see the timer starting at the bottom, and these are your data pages. Uh, your pages, you can scroll through, you can even like enable auto scroll if you want to. Live track just started, and then over here, I just got my live track uh, progress banner. Let's see if you can see it right there. There we go. Um, so it shows up and that's basically sent out to myself as well as to my family and friends. Uh, and then you can again see the exact timers and any other data fields that you configured. Now, one of those things that is on the 965 is native running power, meaning it no longer requires a uh, heart rate strap or any sort of other accessory. It's just using your wrist. And you can see it here, if I looked in one of the data pages, I got it set up. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Right here is what it looked like on the screen there. Uh, but running power will show you how much power you're putting out. Uh, now keep in mind, 
there is no direct relationship between your running power numbers and your cycling power numbers. I know, you know, people would like that to be the case, but there's a lot of like human, you know, mechanic things why that actually shouldn't be the case. Uh, in the case of Stride, for example, one of the running power meters out there, they do roughly match, uh, but those numbers are different than Garmin's numbers, which are different than Polar's numbers, which are different than Apple's numbers. Everyone's numbers are different. And mostly that comes down to what they do and do not include in their algorithms. Uh, which components of things like elastic recoil they do or do not include. Uh, and the scientific community has absolutely no agreement on what should or should not be included. So yeah, they're just there. Train them as you see fit, uh, use them or ignore them, uh, but they are there. One of the new things on the 965 though uh, is running dynamics now are also wrist-based. Uh, in the past, you had to have a chest strap or an RD pod from Garmin uh, that would go ahead and transmit those uh, running dynamic information, things like ground contact time and vertical oscillation, a bunch of like running geekly metrics. You no longer need that. Now you can do it just based on uh, the data from the watch and the wrist itself, which is kind of handy. And then you'll see that both on the watch during the workout, as well as afterwards in Garmin Connect. Again, here's some data screens from that showing some of those different metrics. As far as how to use Run Dynamics, yeah, not really. Um, uh, again, it's been around for like a decade now, and Garmin themselves has still yet to identify how to actually use this data. There are some slim scenarios around uh, recovery. Same thing with like cycling dynamics as well, around coming back from an injury, uh, where if you have like a leg imbalance, you might be able to see a little bit better. But in the vast majority of cases, there's virtually no documentation, data, anything like that on how to actually use this information to get faster in training and racing. Uh, in terms of running power though, there is lots of documentation data out there on how to use a concept of running power to get faster uh, because it responds faster in certain scenarios like that. Uh, but it, some people like to use it, some people don't. Uh, the underlying concept of you know power, whether it be in cycling or running, is, is fairly well understood, even if the numbers displayed here are not consistent from different companies. So that is kind of one thing to kind of balance between those two components. Also, if you want to shut off running power, you can do that as well. Uh, so press this left-hand button right there, run settings all the way on down here, boop, 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 running power. You can turn it off entirely. You can change the source. By default, this is smart mode, meaning it'll use uh, either an accessory, if I have an accessory as the overriding thing, uh, or an accessory from Garmin, to be clear on that, <clears throat> or the wrist-based. Uh, this does not yet support a Stride as an accessory, for example, or RunScribe, or any of the companies pulling their data into this as a third-party running power meter. It does on the cycling side, but not on the running side. Uh, you can choose whether or not to account for wind. Uh, and if you're a Stride user, you probably just want to toggle this off entirely so it doesn't write that data to your Stride file or your file, then I'll put it somewhere else, I'll make a mess of it. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then don't turn this off, honestly. I'll just leave it on, it doesn't hurt anything. And it's just data you might be referred to down the road at some point if you find that useful. Uh, anyways, going on back here, one thing to mention is the stamina data fields. Let me just find this where this went to. Uh, stamina is like body battery, but for your workout. Uh, so the idea here being that you could start your run at what may be 100%, but may not be 100%, actually carries over from previous workouts. Uh, right now, I'm pretty well recovered. Uh, and you can see there, my stamina is 99%, uh, potential 90%, and my pace. And the idea here is that I basically short-term stamina and long-term stamina. So let's think about, for example, an interval workout. Let's say that interval workout is an hour long. Uh, obviously, you're not going to run like full out the entire interval speed for an hour, right? You're going to have your interval, then you have a recovery. Uh, and so you would see that in the case of stamina. If you look at this image right now for one of my recent interval workouts, uh, you see these like dips and valleys that's showing me my recovery up to a certain point. But I also can't, if I was doing like 800s, right, 800 meter repeats, I can't do 800 meter repeats the entire day long. I can't do them for like eight hours. Eventually I would run out of oomph. And that's so that long-term stamina sort of like declining over the course of the workout. And then each time I recover, that short-term potential goes back up and down uh, over the entire workout. And the idea here being that you can use this to pace not necessarily those interval workouts, but actually more for the longer distance events. Uh, and so Garmin says like from a 10K up, uh, I find that, you know, 10K is kind of the, really the bottom threshold there. Theoretically, you do a 5K with this, but I don't find it works that well. Uh, and it shows you basically how long you can maintain that given pace. Uh, so whether it be in distance or in time, uh, and this is true for cycling or running. And it's, it's a pretty cool feature. Uh, last year, I did this on the uh, Phoenix 7 series, uh, and I went out for like a seven hour, six and a half, seven hour ride uh, over a volcano and back again. Uh, and I ended the ride at like 1%, basically 1% and I was kaput. Like I was, sure, I could have gone another couple of kilometers if I had to, like I really, really had to, but I had no energy left. I was drained at this point. And it showed me 1% and that was pretty accurate. And for my other workouts 
sets that I've used this for, it's generally been in the ballpark uh, of what I would expect in terms of judging my overall energy over the course of that particular activity. Uh, now again, as I mentioned earlier on, this is cumulative, meaning that if I did a really, really hard workout today, a really hard workout, and then try to do another workout tomorrow morning, this would not be at 99%. It might be at 80% or 60%. It's using the recovery time as one of the factors into this. Now, once you get to the end of your workout, you can go and just save it by pressing that top button right there. Uh, and you can go down, you press save. Uh, I'm gonna discard this one. Instead, I'm gonna show you what the metrics look like on a different one. So here is my workout last night. This is an interval workout on the treadmill. So you won't see a map up at the top. Normally you'd see a little map picture right there, but you won't see that right here. Uh, I can go down, I can see my pace over the workout. So see each one of those intervals. I can see my heart rate, as you can see, over the course of the uh, workout. Here's my heart rate zones. Here's my running power. Uh, again, it's a really clean, pretty graph. Uh, and then you can see my uh, run power zones, uh, basically divided up there. The trending effect. There's that load at the bottom, the 151. Remember I talked about acute load earlier? This is, you know, 151 towards that 800, wherever my acute load is right now. Uh, and again, certain workouts will be harder and have higher uh, loads, and certain ones will be lower. Uh, and I can go down here, uh, and then I can see on the right-hand side, these are my all stats, training effect, heart rate, running power, laps, uh, and I can kind of look into this in more detail. Now, all of those sport modes work more or less the same way in terms of data customization, data fields, a summary at the extent, et cetera, at the end of them. Certainly, different sport modes have different data fields. Like in cycling, you would have cycling power and cycling cadence. And if you did mountain biking, you had different fields like that. So each sport, again, has the different modes that are available into it. Uh, one of the things that's true across all the sport modes, though, are the GPS or satellite settings, all the outdoor sport modes anyways. Uh, so I'm going to open up the run one again here, choose this, and then I'm going to left hand side and go down to run settings and then go all the way down here at the very bottom uh, to running, there we go, sorry, uh, GPS, and you see auto select. Uh, there's a couple modes in GPS, and auto select is the default. And this is what Garmin calls Sat IQ. And their, their naming here is completely confusing. I don't disagree with that. Uh, the branding is called Sat IQ, uh, but the actual feature is called auto select. Uh, what this means is that it has the ability to scale up to using more power for GPS or scale down to using less power. Uh, so if you look at all the GPS modes, you have off, that's no GPS, obviously, what you use indoors. You have GPS only. That is just using the lowest amount of battery power in only one GPS system or one GNSS system, technically speaking. Uh, and, you know, this is fine if you're out like in a wide open field or on the beach or out in the ocean. GPS only is 100% totally fine. There's no reason to like do overkill beyond that. And this is where you get the most battery power. You can see the battery stats along the bottom of the screen right now for the different modes. Then you get all systems. This uses GPS and GLONASS and Galileo uh, to go ahead and have more systems in place to give you better accuracy. But with that, it burns more battery. And then down below that, you have all systems plus multi-band. So also called dual frequency GPS. Again, the same concept, but this really significantly increases your battery burn, like almost by half in some cases, uh, but it gives the best possible accuracy, crazy good accuracy. Uh, I've tested this, for example, in New York City or up in the Alps, and like it's mind-boggling how much better uh, Garmin's multi-band accuracy is compared to their previous devices, but also their competitor devices. Really only Apple is rivaling them here uh, in these really tough environments uh, with something like the Apple Watch Ultra, which also is multi-band. And then you have Auto Select. And again, Auto Select is new since last summer. And what its main focus is to go ahead and basically dynamically go between the different modes that you saw up above here. Uh, so. Previously, if you wanted really good accuracy, you had to choose multi-band, which meant that you were burning battery at the highest level all the time, even if you didn't need it. So for example, uh, let's say I'm in the mountains and I'm hiking. Uh, if I'm like up against rock cliffs, I want multi-band. That's the, the best accuracy to get the best GPS tracks there. But once I get on top of the ridge line, there's nothing above me. Like, especially if there's no trees above the tree line, that is, there's no reason to use multi-band. That's complete overkill and it's absolutely slaughtering your battery. So the whole purpose of auto select is to dynamically like to the second scale up and down depending on uh, what it sees condition wise. And in my testing, this has been like, spot on. There is no reason anymore to force yourself into multi-band in any scenario. Uh, I've even done tests side by side this uh, across the Alps and it's virtually identical between auto select and uh, the multi-band configuration forced on and uh, in terms of accuracy. But battery life burn is massively different. Uh, and then there's ultra track. Ultra track is if you know you need more battery than this watch can provide uh, and you really need to go somewhere far, far away. I wouldn't use this. Like, 
If that's the scenario that you're going to be finding yourself in beyond the battery capabilities of this watch, I would either A, take a lipstick uh, charger, so basically a very small USB battery bank uh, with a cable. You can charge the watch in real time, uh, or B, choose a different watch. Um, Ultra, Sat, Ultra Slack, Ultra Track, uh, Ultra Crap, whatever you want to call it, uh, it just isn't that good. It basically short circuits things. It only records once every couple minutes, uh, the data points. Uh, it's not what you want to use in really any scenario. Uh, so don't choose that. It's just it's just really bad. Okay, so next up we got sensor pairing here. This will be a quickie. Uh, to go into sensor pairing, middle left hand button, go on down, and you see sensors. Uh, this is where you can add sensors. So these are like cycling sensors, heart rate sensors, speed and cadence sensors, all sorts of AMP plus or Bluetooth sensors. Uh, you can see right now I've got a power meter paired there. And if I go down further, that's all I've got right now. I can choose add new, and here's all the sensor types I can go ahead and pair. Uh, so if I were to go and search right now, uh, search all, it'll search for nearby sensors. I think I've got a few trainers plugged in that might be able to find up there. Maybe one of the bikes. I haven't quite pedaled recently. Uh, yep, it's got one. Uh, so you can see it found an inReach. You found a couple trainers, a power meter. I can show the Bluetooth sensors. And now we just simply tap on this to save it. Uh, if I go back here to this Rally power meter, I can go ahead and I can rename this if I want to. So I can give it my own name if I want to, like, you know, a mountain bike, a road bike, whatever the case is. I can also do a calibration uh, from there and I can look at settings about it. Uh, so all the kind of stuff that you would expect, you can save multiple sensors of the same type if you want to. It's a super useful, mostly for cyclists that may have a bunch of bikes with different sensors on it, uh, or even if you have different heart rate straps, you can save that here as well. Now let's look at some mapping bits. I'm gonna go ahead and tap into run because it's an easier place to show this, uh, but the maps are really true across all the GPS GPS sport activities, it doesn't really matter which one you're in. Uh, so on the left hand side there, uh, the first bit is we'll talk about navigation and then we'll pull up the maps. So navigation allows me to navigate different places. So I can do a course, these are things that load onto the watch from either Garmin Connect or Strava or Komoot or a gazillion data sources out there. You can use either one that are pushed into those platforms. For example, Strava routes will automatically push to Garmin, push this to your watch, all happens like this. Or you can load up a GPX file if you want to, that all ends up under the courses area. Points of interest uh, around me. These are things where I can look at stuff that's around me. So I can go ahead and find stuff that's nearby and then route to that particular thing. Uh, so if I go ahead and just choose something in this area right there, uh, you can see these are, you know, the bus station, for example. I can go there if I want to. Uh, I can go down to round trip courses. This allows me to say, hey, I want a course of a given length. Let's call it 10 kilometers. Uh, yep, confirm that. Any direction, sure, I don't really care. And it'll create these courses here. They take a couple seconds, maybe like 30, 40 seconds to create each one. These are cool if you're like somewhere that you just wanna run 10K or 5K or go out for a 50K ride. Uh, it'll create these courses for you on demand. And it's using all the heat map data that Garmin has. So it won't route you like onto a highway. It's gonna route you where other Garmin users run, ride, et cetera, which, you know, you're talking millions of activities and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of activities out there. Uh, so generally speaking, these are actually pretty good for the most part. Uh, so you can do that there. I'm just gonna back out there. You can use past activities. You can use save locations, uh, site and go coordinates, or use the map itself. Uh, I'm gonna load up a course though, just to, to show you this really quickly here. Uh, so these are different courses I've had in the last little while. Uh, so courses I used in Florida, for example, uh, I have little gator bait, big gator bait, uh, big Florida loop. So if I open this up right now, this is show me that particular uh, course and it'll show me the mapping information for it, uh, elevation, all that will be displayed in here. In this case, there's not much elevation in this part of Florida, so not much to see there. Uh, courses can take a little bit of time to load depending on the length of the course. In this case, it's 80K, about 50 miles. It only has about 48 meters of elevation though. Uh, I can then look at the course, do course, I can look at the map. You can see this is the way the chevrons show the direction of the course travel. I can zoom in. Uh, so I can just tap these buttons here. I can move around, tap, 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 tap. Uh, and eventually I get lower down. I can see, this is all like in the swamplands. You can see some imagery of what this actually looked like out there with tons of gators. Uh, it was actually kind of a lot of fun. Uh, I ended up doing a slightly different variation of this particular loop here uh, because things were closed, but uh, still I can use my finger to move around if I want to. There's really not much on this particular map section because again, it's like gator land. Uh, but if I move over here, you can see these are some of the neighborhoods uh, and the camera is having some issues with like the, the brightness of the screen right now. So that's why you're seeing that, let it kind of readjust right there. Uh, again, I can zoom down further in these neighborhoods and you can start to see more of the details there. I'll move my hands out so I can go ahead and readjust to that. Let me just uh, pull up a little bit more there. Uh, you can see there we go. Uh, and showing you some of the points of interest as well along with that. Uh, Again, the screen is super bright right now, but you can kind of see what's going on there. Uh, so anyways, that is the map of the course itself. Uh, now, if I just go back out here, 
Assuming I load that course up, I could then route against that course. So for example, you can see on one of my runs where I use the routing around a neighborhood I wasn't super familiar with to go ahead and I'll get churn by churn directions for that. Uh, so it tells me to churn as I'm upcoming. In the case of running, it's about 50 meters out and selecting maybe it's like 120, 150 meters out from the churn. Uh, that tells you that churn's coming up, tells you to turn left or right, uh, tells you what to turn on. Uh, and it uses rerouting if you miss a particular churn because it knows the underlying uh, map set for it. And all that works pretty well well in my testing so far on the 965 as well as the 955. I hadn't really had any problems with that. I've also tested just like picking a point in a map here uh, the other day and I had no problems doing that either. Now in terms of the maps that are loaded, by default it'll have the uh, region where you bought the watch. So you buy your watch in North America, has the North America maps, you buy it in Europe, has European maps. Uh, there is 32 gigs of storage on this particular uh, device on the 965 and you can load maps from other regions. So if I go into the map settings, I can press this middle button right there. I go on down here into maps, you'll find that eventually, map, there we go, map manager. Uh, this is where you can see the maps that I have available uh, and the maps that I've loaded. So these are course view, that's golf stuff and some skiing ones. Uh, the ones I really want though are the topo active maps. So you can see right now I have the topo active North America maps and the topo active Europe maps, topo active Europe maps. I can also add a map and both of these have updates available. Uh, so if I were to plug this watch in, uh, it'll connect to Wi-Fi and check for those updates. I can also go and add a map here. Uh, it's gonna search for Wi-Fi again. You can do maps via Wi-Fi or you can do maps connected to your computer via USB cable. I promise you, you wanna do them via USB cable. It's just way, 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 way faster. Uh, the Wi-Fi in this is functional, but it'll take like three to four hours to download one of these bigger maps. They're about 10 or 11 gigs in most cases. Uh, the computer will take like 30 to 60 minutes in my experience in most cases to get them on a computer and onto your watch. Now, once it's connected up, you can see the additional maps you can download. So Topo Active Africa, Australia, and so on, down through the list right there. Uh, and you can just tap on these and again, start the download process uh, once you're plugged into the cable. And I would also recommend, if you can put your watch near your Wi-Fi access uh, thingamajig, it'll improve the speeds really dramatically. Like I can't overstate that enough. Uh, the difference between here and moving it, you know, like 20 feet over there next to the Wi-Fi thing behind the wall is massive. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. Uh, now. With that, let's talk about music. So we got all the map stuff covered up. Uh, oh, flashlight, I forgot about that. So one thing you may not realize, just totally random here, is that while the 965 does not have a flashlight on the front of it, you can use the display as a flashlight. And there's two ways to get into that. Uh, you can hold this upper left hand button right there and you can find the flashlight in the little menu right there. And if it's not in there, as it is not in my particular case, you can also add it. So I could choose back. I can go hold this middle button right there. I can go down to my uh, appearance. I can go to controls and then I can go all the way down. I can find flashlight once on the add new and do, 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 flashlight, right? Now the control is added, so I can go back up to the top, pull the left-hand button again, and I can find flashlight uh, and turn it on. And I can increase the brightness. Uh, and then again, in this bright room, it's not really gonna notice it. Uh, but if I go down here, I can go down to the red mode as well, which is even less bright than the white modes. And these modes are more than bright enough for any room. Like the display here is incredibly bright, just people don't realize that, uh, but it's incredibly bright. And I can go ahead and I can go into the three levels of white or the red one there. Uh, so this is again, like, you know, using your phone in the old school days before they had flashlights where you just use the screen itself. Uh, but you can also enable this using hotkeys. And in my case, I create a hotkey by long holding this below right hand button to access the same thing. To create hotkeys, left hand button again, the settings, and go on down here to, I think it's hotkeys in the first level, is that right? Uh, nope, system. Here we go, somewhere hotkeys. Uh, and then I chose to change this one, hold back, and I set it for the flashlight. But you can set it for any number of other things that you want it to be. Uh, you can customize all these. Anyways, music. Uh, on this watch, you can go ahead and download music to it. You can download MP3 files. Uh, you can even download like podcast manually if that's kind of cumbersome. Um, or you can use offline music services. You can use Spotify, Amazon Music, Deezer being the big three right here. Uh, in my case, I use Spotify. Once you've got that paired up to your account and it's super easy, you just go down into the music settings. Let me find music, uh, doo -doo -doo, right there, music controls. Uh, and it'll go ahead and basically walk you through Spotify pairing. There we go. Uh, now, if you hadn't already paired it up, it'll go ahead and uh, prompt you to pair it with your phone, it takes a couple seconds and you're good to go. Uh, in my case, I have paired up and I've already added a particular set of music here uh, called Popped Pump for the fun of it. 
I can add music though by just choosing this option right there. I can then pull up my playlists. And this pulls from my Spotify account and shows me a uh, recent playlist. Uh, first, I believe, uh, and then kind of the order that you played them. Not entirely sure why it thinks I've done Christmas peaceful piano recently, but uh, maybe it does. Um, in any case, I can then choose one of these and go ahead and download them. Uh, so I could just choose this right there. It'll search for Wi-Fi and it'll start downloading it. Uh, it's not super fast either here, but it is faster than it has been in the past. Again, the closer you put it to your Wi-Fi access point, the faster it will be. Uh, so that'll start and then you see a 0% complete and it'll kind of iterate through those songs. Uh, anyways, I'm gonna cancel out of that for right now though. Uh, if I go back again here, back again, you can see down the bottom, I can also update downloads. I find, by the way, this is a great way to do podcasts because uh, if you use the Garmin podcast thing, it requires you physically plug into your computer. It's super cumbersome. Uh, instead, use basically Spotify or one of the other streaming services to handle your podcast, and then it'll automatically update them uh, right here. And this will also automatically update the Spotify uh, playlist when you plug it into a uh, something to charge. Anytime it does that and then range of Wi-Fi, it'll do that for you automatically. Uh, anyways. I can then choose one of these and then go ahead and play it. I've got my headphones right here. You have to have some sort of Bluetooth audio device. Uh, it does not you know, have a speaker in this to go ahead and play music. It has a beeper so it can like make beeps and chirps for like intervals and whatever else, but uh, it doesn't play music out of this here. So to play this, I just simply hit the play button right there. It'll go ahead and connect to these headphones uh, and you can see it starts playing. And you can kind of hear, I don't know. I'll turn the volume so I can press this middle button. Uh, choose volume and then increase. I can also increase volume uh, on these if I that was supported that particular audio device. Uh, and you can hear the music now. Well, where's my mic? Over here. There we go. Um, so I don't want to get like a copyright request, but you can hear it is playing music to it. Um, so there we go. Uh, and I can skip tracks if I want to and go back. Uh, the whole point of this though isn't to be like a hugely uh, detailed music player. It's designed to like make it really easy to use during a workout or any other uh, scenario. I can also, for example, turn repeat on or off or shuttle, shuffle. Uh, that's all offered here. None of this has changed since other Garmin watches uh, from a music standpoint. It's just simply here as well with a prettier display. Uh, so with that all set, let's talk about the very last item, which is Garmin Pay. Uh, so I have my fancy dancy card reader right here. Uh, so I can pretend to be a store and I have my phone. In my case, I've loaded up my credit card onto this already. Uh, now, Garmin Pay is supported uh, with your bank. It's not supported with like all Visa or all MasterCard or all Amex. Uh, so it has to be your particular bank. Uh, in the US, bank coverage is pretty darn good for credit cards, like Chase is covered, for example. Uh, in other countries, it varies. Uh, just type in like Garmin Pay Bank so they'll find this gigantic list by country uh, and it's always kind of changing. So just to show you what this looks like in real time, I have got here uh, a basically a fake uh, water bottle. I actually have real water bottle. Uh, and I can charge it one euro, one dollar, and I'll say card reader over here, and then this will use my card reader just like I was at a store. Uh, and there we go. And then over here on the watch, I would go ahead and access it using my controls menu. There are different ways to do this again, but in this case, I will choose my wallet. Uh, there we go. And then on the watch, if I have it on my wrist, it'll keep this passcode there stored until I take it off the wrist. In this case, obviously I took it off my wrist, therefore the passcode is no longer stored, so I'll type the passcode in. And at this point, you can see it says hold near a card reader. I have my card reader right there, uh, and I can go just tap it just like this, and boom, it's done. It's it's really that simple. Uh, payment approved, now I pay it. I paid myself one buck, and now I've lost whatever that is in transaction fees along the, along the way. Uh, it's as simple as that. It works across the board at any place that accepts contactless payments. Again, as usual with this, this is great if you know the establishment you're going to use uh, supports contactless payments. So let's say you have a weekly run, you go out for rides, and you know that the cafe at certain places supports this, then you don't need to take your wallet with you. I wouldn't just go out into the wild with just uh, your watch and hope for the best. But then in the US last week, I learned this the hard way when I went into a, a Walmart to buy a bunch of groceries, had it all there and found out that no, I didn't have my, my wallet with me. I just had a, my phone to tap pay and that didn't that wouldn't work out at all. So uh, just again, keep in mind that you want to validate where you're going actually has uh, support for this. Uh, so with that, we've covered everything there is to cover on the 965. We've got it back on my wrist. I am ready to keep on rolling. Uh, again, if you want to see my full review on all the new features, that's up in the corner there, as well as a comparison to the Garmin Epic watches, also up in the corner there as well. And as I said before, if you did find this interesting or useful, it really does help out the video and the channel to whack that like button or the subscribe button so you get plenty more sports technology goodness. Have a good one.